I'm Randy Garris, and welcome to uh, number six in our series of Chasing After Emotional Maturity. We began this series talking about the fact that everybody struggles with this box of emotions that God gave us. They're a gift to us, uh, 25 or 30 emotions that are a reflection of what, what God wants us to have, parts of his own nature. But having those emotions to be mature and not immature is a battle for everyone. I was joking with my wife as I was uh, coming over here to, to, to uh, uh, do this. What kind of an arrogant man would stand here and, and say, let me talk to you about your emotional maturity. Truth is all of us uh, wrestle with it. Here's the truth that I have to unpack those emotions with the Lord and the Lord's people in order for them to ever be healthy. And if I never unpack them well with the Lord and the Lord's people, they're, they're not gonna be a blessing to me. And so how do you unpack them? Well, we've been going that through the series and I won't summarize all of it. It wouldn't be, uh, uh, wouldn't have time. But, but in essence, it has to have this, the discipline of, of silence and solitude with the Lord. There are things I have to hear from the Lord to have him unpack it for me. Uh, there's also the concept of the deeper story. Your emotions are not tied to what you speak at the surface. They're tied to the deepest story you believe. And unless the gospel in Christ changes your deeper story, then you can verbalize this and actually think that's where you live, but your emotions are, are betraying your deeper story. We talked about the role of friendships, and, and truth is in the American culture and the Western culture, uh, we have to battle hard to get a handful of godly friends who know everything about me. It's not easy to do, it's not the nature of our culture. And it takes a great deal of perseverance and endurance for that to happen. But that's where we've been. What we're gonna do in this session is we're gonna talk about the connection, this mysterious connection between how you think and how you feel. And do you do right direction thinking? Because if you don't do right direction thinking, your emotions are, are gonna go a different direction and you won't like where they take you. It sometimes feels like our emotions and our thinking are not connected. You'll hear someone say every now and then, I think my emotions have a mind of their own. And, and there's a little truth to that. But the deeper truth, the bigger truth, the more accurate truth is how you think is actually how you will eventually begin to feel. And, and what you feel is a direct result of, of what your long-term thinking is. And so as we kick this thing through, maybe there's a way to ask, do you know the pattern by which you think? Because the pattern by which you think is reflected in your emotions. I wanna give credit to a guy named uh, Dr. Tim Jennings. Uh, he's a, a, a Christian psychiatrist. I, 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 I was in his um, seminar one time and, and he sparked these ideas. I wanna blame him for everything that I'm about to do, but, but I wanna give him credit for the, the sparking of it. As he had his practice, both, both individual counseling and, 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 and inpatient, he said he began to notice a contrast. Let's see if I can help with that. He said, I began to notice Christians, people who love Jesus and people who wanted to have a heart for Christ, but I noticed there's a pattern. I noticed they often felt trapped. And he said, as they felt trapped, he said that, that being trapped had three results to it. He said, they almost always had, and I'm just gonna put that, they almost always had low self-esteem. That low self-esteem, I'm not, I'm not worth a lot. He said, they also had a, a decrease and a, and a flattening of what I'm gonna call the longing emotions. Well, what do you mean by longing emotions? Well, everybody longs to feel joy and loved. Everybody longs to have people who are proud of them. Uh, everybody has longing emotions. And so if you ask them, do you feel loved by people? Do you feel like you grew up with people who love you? They may say, well, I know they did, but I, I, I don't really feel loved. No, I don't really feel joy. I don't. And so a decrease in those. He said there was one other thing that was always down, and that was personal empowerment. I'm just gonna abbreviate it. Personal empowerment. Personal empowerment, when we'd say, do you feel like that your life makes a difference? Do you feel like that you can go out and change some things in the world for the sake of the kingdom? And they would go, ah, I don't know that I can make any difference. 
And he said, I'm finding people who love Christ, but that's what's happening. He said, on the other hand, maybe in the same family, he said, I would find Christ followers who felt just the opposite. They felt a great deal of freedom. That freedom that they felt, it, it showed itself in all of those ways. They, they had a higher self-esteem. If you don't care, I'm going to abbreviate. They had a higher sense of the longing emotions. Do you feel loved? Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like I am loved. I feel, I feel like people do care. I do feel joy. And they had a higher sense of personal empowerment. They might say, no, I know I'm not the hottest things in sliced bread, but, but I know that my life can make a difference, and I feel like my life makes a difference. And he said, so I'm in the same church, I'm in the same worship service, I'm in the same small group, I'm in the same family, and there are people who feel trapped, and there are people who also feel freedom. Uh, how, how's that happen? He said, I began to notice there's a direction of thinking. There's a way you think that produces those. It's probably not thinking on any one thing. It's a pattern of thinking. I don't have any idea how many times you think a day, but I'm going to throw this out. You, you, you think, think 500 thoughts a day. I don't know if you realize it or not, but you have a pattern. You do. We don't start with neutral. We have a pattern and a template in how we think, and we reproduce it all the time. Were we in an environment where I could toss you this this, this, this pen, this marker, you wouldn't even have to think about it. As I threw it in the air to you, unexpectedly, you would automatically reach with your dominant hand and you would catch it because you've spent your entire life with a dominant way of doing something. When you think, you have a dominant way of thinking. It just automatically occurs. In fact, you have to work very hard sometimes to confront that dominant way of thinking. Well, what is the process by which we ought to think? When I begin to talk about scriptures, and the scriptures say, Randy, you need to think right so that your emotions are right. Maybe this is the time to simply point out the scriptures say, I do need to think right. We're going to get to this in a second. I want you to hear the scriptures. In Philippians 4, Paul ties together how you feel with how you think. For example, in, in Philippians 4, if I were to point out, starting in the fourth verse, he uses feelings words like rejoice and rejoice. He uses words like gentleness and anxiousness and peace, and, and he uses all of those, but look what he ties it to. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, he says this, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. There's a connection, a mysterious connection, but a connection between how I think and how I feel. If I just turn the page, if I come to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 is going to start off in verses 1 and 2, verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on things. And he begins to tell me how to set my mind. But if I read the next 17 verses, what I find is he begins to weave in how I think and how I feel and how I behave. Thinking is here. So how do I think that either produces for me to be trapped and to have lower self-esteem and lower longing emotions, and lower personal empowerment? Or how do I think that causes me to have just the opposite, freedom? I'm going to use an illustration, and I'm going to go through the process, I think, by which we ought to think, by which we were designed to think. I could use illustrations about how do you think about your, your mom and the complex relationship with your mom. I could think about how you deal with with a child that, that doesn't seem to respect you. I could, I could talk about your boss. I could talk about episodes in your own past. I, there's any number of illustrations I could use, but so that I don't distract, I'm gonna use what I know seems silly and, 
and I, I apologize, but I think I, I can keep the illustration from distracting. So what if I had the thought, I wonder if I should rob a bank today? I, please don't call anyone on 911. I, this is hypothetical. But what if I had a thought, I wonder if I should rob a bank today? There's a couple ways I can think about that. But let's start with the, the, the sequence. It, it, it begins a little like this. Man, I, I haven't got any money and everybody else has money and everybody else seems to be able to do things I can't do. And, and I have fear. I don't know whether I'll be able to pay my rent. I don't know whether I'll be, have groceries. I, I begin to have all kinds of, of jealousy. They went on a trip, but I can't go on a trip. I, I begin to have a sense of powerlessness. Boy, and the currency of life is in the stuff in the bank and I don't have that. And so, and I begin to have all these thoughts. So should I rob a bank today? Tim Jennings said, he began to notice the pattern that produced these starts with this. If I do the right way of thinking, it starts with this. It starts with, what is the heart of God? What's the heart of God? So if I thought, Randy, should you rob a bank today? And my first thought that I begin with is, well, I, God's not a bully and God wouldn't want me to bully somebody. And, and God is a God who knows me and loves me. And, and, and God is somebody who partners in my life. And, and the heart of God, I, I, I can't imagine that he would want me to rob a bank. And so I start the thinking to come down to the next logical thing. What is, what does my reason What does my reason tell me? Well, my reason tells me that they lock bank robbers up. And I, I, I don't think I, I, I want to rob a bank because I don't think I want to be locked up. And not only does that, but, but I even kind of can reason that I don't think robbers actually do well in the rest of their life. And even if I never got caught, I don't think there's honor among thieves. And and so I, I begin with this sequence. What's the heart of God? And I, now that doesn't fit. What does my reason tell me? No, that doesn't fit. I go to the third thing. What do my longing emotions, longing emotions, what do my longing emotions tell me? Well, I don't want somebody to be frightened of me, me holding a gun against some poor person. I, I, I want people to be proud of me. I want people to feel safe with me. I, I want to be proud of myself. And, and so as I begin this sequence of what's the heart of God, wh what's my reason tell me, what are my longing emotions tell me, I, I begin to, to come down. And, and so I come down and I make a decision. My decision is I'm not going to rob a bank. Now, that's the, at some level, the easy part. Now I have a hard part I have to do. I have to stand in the face of negative emotions. I have to stand in the face of negative emotions. I've made my decision, I'm not gonna rob a bank, but now I have to stand here with my sense of fear. I have to stand here in my sense of longing for, boy, I wished I had more. I, I have to stand in the face of, of, of any jealousy I feel. But I've made my decision and it's come this direction. And so now all I have to do is have the courage to actually stand through that thinking process. Crazy thing is, and you know this to be true, Four hours later, the next morning, I wake up and quite frankly, I'm pretty proud of myself. I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. I made my decision. I stood in the middle of that, that longing emotions. And the next morning, I wake up and I go, you know what? Randy, you didn't give in to that. Randy, you didn't become. Um, wow, that would have been a real train wreck if you did that. And the crazy thing is, what automatically happens is it produces and I'm just going to put it over here, it produces where I come in, I actually feel more freedom. My self-esteem has gone up. My longing emotions actually come a little more alive. And personal empowerment is higher. And the 
consequence and the sequence of thinking from top down delivers me to this. Well, then I'll have 50 other thoughts today, a hundred other thoughts, But when I began to put a pattern that goes, what's the heart of God? What does my reason tell me? What do my longing emotions tell me? What what would I like to be true about my life? And I make a decision, and then I have the courage to stand in the face of whatever those, well, anger or lust or or, or sadness or, or whatever longing emotions I have, selfishness, when I stand in the face of those things and succeed, this is what I feel. But what if I took it the other direction? What if my thinking starts this direction? I start with a sense of, wow, I'm not being treated right in life. And I begin to to have a sense of anger and frustration. I'm going to move it to maybe something more personal. You hate the interaction you have with your mom. You're always uncomfortable. And you begin to fear that interaction with your mom. Or you begin to have an anger about your interaction with your mom. And you have that negative emotions. And again, it can be anger, it can be selfishness, it can be lust, it can be any number of things that have these, these negative emotions. And when I begin to say, I'm, I don't have any choice. I don't have any choice but to deal with mom like this. I, I have to do what mom tells me, or I have to stay away from mom, or I have to, and you just fill the blank in. When you begin to say, I don't have any choice, the decision is actually made for me by those negative emotions. Then you make a decision in light of the negative emotions. Well, what do you have to do with your longing emotions to feel proud of yourself? You, you, you've got to numb that. You've got to put a little morphine in. Well, what's that do with your reason? You have to begin to twist your reason. You have to begin to say, well, normally this wouldn't be right, but in light of my mom's bad behavior and in light of my mom and and my relationship, and so you have to twist your reason. Well, what do you do with the heart of God? Well, then you've got to begin to do something that goes, I don't think God cares, or I don't think God's present, or you begin to have to warp where God is, and you work your way this direction, and I know you can't see anything I'm doing now, but here's what will happen. You begin to feel trapped because you say to yourself, I didn't have any choice. I I had to do that. The way my boss is, I had to do that. The way my husband is, I had to do that. The way my parents are, I had to do that. And when you begin to have this pattern of thinking, this is where it will take you. And it will take you over and over and over. And once you learn the pattern, you begin to do this. And so everything becomes that pattern. Let me take just even one your longing emotions. Everybody wants to feel loved. Everybody wants to feel appreciated. Everybody wants to feel like they're valued. There are behaviors that you could do that might cause you to feel more loved and valued. But let me assume, and again, silly illustration and my apology, if I took a gun and I held a gun to you and I said, I want you to go to five people We're going to go together, and I have a gun on you, and you're going to hug five people, and you're going to tell them kind things, and you're going to have an interaction with five people, and this is what you have to do. And I I blackmailed you. I pressured you. So you went to five people, and you hugged them, and you told them kind things. Did you get any warm fuzzies whatsoever from that interaction? Of course not. It's forced. It's forced. And when your negative emotions drive most of your decisions, you always feel trapped and forced, and this is always what you will have. So at some point in time, you've got to sit down and say, wait a second. The throne of my life, the driver of my life, are the things I ought to stand in the face of, not turn over the steering wheel. When you work from the top down, it goes like this. I know my mom is difficult and I know it's a hard situation, but I know what the heart of God is. And I either need to be courageous with my mom or I need to to be bold with my mom or I need to be kind with my mom. I'm not sure what the process of your story would be. 
What's my reason tell me? My reason tells me if I keep doing what the generations ahead of me kept doing, what's my longing emotions? I wanna be proud of myself. And when you make a decision and now you stand in the face of it, I guarantee you. Now, one decision in itself won't always produce that, but it's the series. So here's the question, do you do top-down thinking or do you do bottom-up thinking? If you do bottom-up thinking, you're going to feel trapped. Now, here's also another truth. Most of us are not exclusively one thing or the other. There's a continuum. If, if I would start over here, there's somebody who always does bottom-up thinking. Or over here, there's someone who always does top-down thinking. Truth is, most of us are somewhere in the middle. And according to what mood we're in, according to the circumstance, According to what happens, sometimes we do top-down thinking and sometimes we do bottom-up thinking and we vacillate back and forth and that's why we have inconsistency. And that's why the emotional moods began to move. What if I became more consistent and simply said, this is how I was made. This is the accompanied life with the Lord. This is the partnered life I live. This is the disciple life. I'm going to guarantee you something. I call myself an old man, an old man, and I know there are many men that are older, but but I'm going to tell you as an old man, I've seen that play out. I guarantee you that the sequence of how I think out of Philippians 4 and the sequence of how I think in Colossians 3, the sequence of how I think 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the sequence by which I think either gives me trapped or gives me freedom. Christ invites me to the freedom. We're about to run out of time. I, I want to give you something just very specific. I'm going to give you a, a minor possibility. It's not an assignment. There would be no value if I gave you an assignment. But how about an experiment? What if I took just one aspect? As I was reading through Colossians 3 and preparing for this, I was just reminded of this again. In Colossians 3, there's a word at the very end of that text, uh, the first 17 verses, that shows up over and over. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since you're members of one body, you are called to be peace, at peace and be thankful. Verse 16, singing to the Lord with gratitude in your heart. Thankful, gratitude. Uh, come down to verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Boy, that seems to be top-down thinking. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's interesting that he mentions you set your mind on things above, and he begins to talk about how you do that, and he finishes with gratitude, thankfulness, gratitude, thankfulness, and he just, he just hammers them in. It's interesting, we get patterns of thinking, and you have to do something to break that pattern. I'm gonna recommend a, a simple little exercise, a little exercise built around gratitude. It comes out of your, your sense of the view of God. Uh, several different times in my life, I've had to dress up for special occasions. Everybody has these same stories. I, I was going to go meet so-and-so or meet the president or meet the governor or something, whatever. Everybody has stories like this. And you stand in front of your closet and you think, oh, man, I, want, I wonder what I should wear today. You, it may not be a clothes hog, but you think about it. I wonder what I should wear. Well, one of the questions that you have to have in the back of your mind is when I meet with the king of the universe every single day, what, what do I wear? He tells me what to wear. In Psalm 100, in passages like Colossians, um, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And he says the next thing, thanksgiving. Why? Because God is, is so insecure, he has to have our thanksgiving? And no. What if thanksgiving is God's gift to you so you can do top-down thinking? What if thanksgiving became a pattern in my thinking? What would that do? It starts me here and begins... What if it's actually God winking at the angels and saying, watch this? Here's the exercise. What if you took 30 days 
Instead, at the end of each day, I'm going to sit down with a journal and I'm going to write down five things that I'm thankful for today that I've seen the hand of God. Five things today that I actually can so say before the Lord, I really am coming to your presence trying to be properly dressed. Here are five things I'm thankful for. Five, three, one is what I'm going to call this pattern. Five things I'm thankful for. What if you could list three people I'm grateful to? People, maybe it was somebody in your past, maybe present, maybe it's a guy across the hall. You go over and say, hey, thanks, by the way. Well, what if it's just, what if you just gave thought to three people I'm grateful to? Five things I'm grateful for, three people I'm grateful to, and one of those people are going to hear from me today. I send a text and go, hey, John, I was, I was thinking about you driving down the road today, and I, I just want you to know. Or maybe it's an old youth minister. Maybe it's a, a teacher you had. Or, or maybe it's just walking across the hall to Susie and you say, I don't think I tell you often enough. You, you. And so what would happen if you had 30 days of I simply began to do the 531? It, it's just a way of doing some of the top-down thinking. For what it's worth, I think you would find that when Paul says in Philippians 4, Whatever's true, right, noble, think on those things. Whenever he says in Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, I think you would find it's not a demand of Scripture, it's a gift of Scripture. Would you like to have freedom? Emotional maturity comes because we think in the right directions. May God bless you in the process.